Hello class, in this video, we're gonna go over the review for test number two, which is gonna cover the topics from chapters four, five, and six. Um, before I start, I do wanna mention that there are 39 questions on this review. And this is the note sheet that I used while taking this review. And when I take the test, um, and I do take my own tests, I take my own test, I write out all the steps really nice and neat and slowly as I can. Um, and I record myself and then I enter all my answers into the canvas and I time myself. So however long it takes me to do the test, um, I multiply my time by three and that's how long it should take students to take the same test. Um, of course, if a student does not know the information as well as they should, it might take that student longer to take that same test. But if you do know the material as you should at this point, it should not take you longer than the allotted test time to complete the test. So I do get some complaints sometimes where students are like, I didn't have enough time to finish all the problems on the test. That is because you didn't understand the material enough to complete all the problems on the test within the allotted time. Um, that had nothing to do with the fact that you know it all like the back of your hand and you just couldn't, you didn't have enough time to write down all the steps and then answer your stuff in the computer. And I know that that's not the case because I'm writing down all the steps thoroughly and neatly, drawing all my graphs, everything, um, and entering in my answers and then multiplying my total time by three. So I know for a fact that that should be ample time for you guys. Every now and then I will multiply my own time by five, um, but that's just if I feel like it's a really difficult um, content. So anyway, I did mention to you guys on that test, I know for test one, um, there's a, a mention of it in the directions. It's the same thing on test two. You are allowed to use a note sheet. It's just with test one, there really wasn't any, a whole lot of notes to write. Um, but for this section, we um, there are some notes here. And so these notes are not provided on that standard note sheet that they give you at the top of the test, which is basically these formulas, which we haven't gotten to yet, um, and then these. So for test one, you were only using these top pieces of information. We have not gotten to anything else. And then we got to all of this set stuff in this unit, and there was no notes over the set stuff. So this is my notes. You can take a, you know, pause the video, write it all down, what you want. You can add to it, but this is literally, I mean, this is a post-it, um, but this is what I used when I was doing the review and then when I'm gonna take the test, okay? So it's just basically talking about the formula for the cardinal number of A or B, meaning the union. Um, I wrote the statements here that or means union and means this. And also we know that the word but also means that, um, and then not means the complement, means a complement. Um, these are all the different Euler diagram possibilities. I do have complement there as that. Intersection is what the two sets have in common. Union is the two sets all together. Um, and then we had some basic rules that they had us proving. Um, we, I don't probably, I don't even think I use these bits of information, but it's there. So let's go on. So for numbers one through three, we've got these directions here. Identify the, a pattern in the given set of numbers, then use this pattern to find the next number. So for number one, it's one seventh, one tenth, one thirteenth, one sixteenth, one nineteenth, and then a blank. And so what I noticed is that the one was staying consistent throughout all of the numerators. So I anticipated that there would be a one in the next numerator. The denominators though, seem to be increasing by three units. So I increased the last um, entry by three units and I ended up with the denominator of 22. And this was in fact the correct answer. Now, number two, so the numbers are 4, 9, 13, 22, 35, 37, and then a blank. And so what I did here was I tried to figure out what it was increasing by each time. And I recognized this pattern, okay? Now, other than the first one, because when you have um, sequences or series, you can define your first um, number. 
if you don't define your first number, it's usually one, okay? But if you can, if you can define your first number, it may not have come from anywhere, okay? Um, which means something may not have happened to something before it to get this one. This may be just the genuine starting point, okay? Um, so when I tried to figure out what was going on here, it increased by five. But here it increased by four, and then nine, and then 13, and then 22. And then so I realized, look at these numbers, four, nine, 13, 22. Those are the exact same numbers that we have here. So I don't know what made this increase. I mean, was the number that would have been before it five? I don't know. This could have just been defined as the first number. So that's why I X this out because I don't know what happened before. So I don't know what's happening here or why it's occurring. But I did recognize the rest of the pattern that here they were basically adding these two numbers together. Okay, so the previous number was getting added to that. Then for the next one, the previous one was getting added to it to get the next one. Then the previous and the current give you the next. The previous and the current give you the next. The previous and the current gave me the next. So instead of adding 22, the next one I added 35. And if I wanted another one, I would add 57. If I wanted another one, I'd add 92 and so on and so forth, okay? So number three, said study the pattern in these examples. So you have a to the power six, some symbol, a to the second power equal to a to the 14. Here we have a, I know it looks like a two, but it's not, it's an a. Um, a to the fifth power symbol, a to the third power, and I get a to the 17, a to the cube, a to the six, and that gives me a to the 20. So it says, select the equation that describes the pattern, and here are the four choices. And so all I did was use each of those four choices to see which one works for all three, okay? So the first one says that they're doing two times X plus Y. So two times this number plus this number. So for, I just took the middle one as my example. So if I take A to the fifth and A to the third, that means I'm gonna do two times five plus three which is 10 plus three, which is 13, but that's not equal to the eight of the 17 like they've got there. So this can't possibly be it because it doesn't give me what's up there. So it doesn't follow the pattern. Here, the next one is, is to do the X plus two times the Y. So five plus two times the three, that's gonna be six. Five plus six is 11. I'm still not getting that eight of the 17. Next one is to do x plus y plus four. So I'm doing five plus three plus four, which turns out to give me 12. Again, it's still not eight of the 17. Last one says to multiply the two exponents together and then add two. So in that case, I get 15 plus two, which is 17. And that does match what I had before. So, and then I just go to see the others. If I multiply these together, I get 12 and I add two, that's 14. If I multiply these two together, I get 18. And if I add two, I do get 20. So it is this pattern that is happening. Now, number four has its own directions. It says traveling at an average rate of between 50 and 60 miles per hour for five to eight hours, select the best estimate for the distance traveled. And the options were 175 miles, 370, 335, and 475 miles. So the minimum that we can do is we can take the slowest speed, 50 miles per hour, and multiply that by the lowest number of hours, which was five. So that gives me 250 miles. This is the absolute lowest. So this is like the minimum, okay? Um, since it's the minimum, it can't be any lower than that. So it's definitely going to outroll the 175 miles. Now the maximum is to take the maximum speed multiply it by the greatest time, and then that gives me this value, 480 miles. Now it outrolls 475 miles since it's so close to the max. We know we were not pushing it so close to 60 the whole way and so close to eight hours. If that were the case, these numbers would be a lot higher. Um, and so then we've gotten rid of that. Then now basically you take the average of those, of the minimum and the maximum. So I'm doing, adding these two numbers together and dividing by the number of numbers. There's two numbers. 
So I'm dividing by two. So I get 730 divided by two, which is 365. And that's pretty close to the 370 option. And so that's going to be our answer. And it was in fact marked correct. Now, number five says 10 people ordered calculators. The least expensive was $29.95 and the most expensive was $69.95. Half of them ordered a $39.95 calculator. Select the best estimate of the amount spent on calculators. And so these are four options, 340, 440, 530, and 555. So what we did was, since we knew that half of them were ordered at $39.95, we did five of those 10 at this price, and then five of the 10 at the lowest price. So this is going to give me my minimum. Then we did the same thing for the maximum. So we did the half being ordered at $39.95, and then the other half, all of them being ordered at the high end amount, which was 69.95, and we got this value. Then what we did was we took the average between those two. So we added the two numbers and divided by two and we ended up with 449.5. And the closest one to that is 440. So that was our response. Now, number six, I'm trying to scoot this up there. There we go. So for number six, it says the bar graph gives the average atmospheric concentration of carbon dioxide. A, estimate the yearly increase in the average atmospheric concentration of carbon dioxide. Express the answer in parts per million. B, write a mathematical model that estimates the average atmospheric concentration of carbon dioxide. Um, C, in parts per million, X years after 1950. And C, if the trend shown by the data continues, use your mathematical model from part B to project the average atmospheric concentration of carbon dioxide in 2040. And so here's the image that we're given. This is the graph. This is the graph of the average atmospheric concentration of carbon dioxide. Here's the scale in parts per million. And then here are the years in which this data is getting collected. And so it does give me the exact values here. I don't have to kind of guess them. Um, and so what is that average? Part A tells me to estimate the average atmospheric. So that means I need to take this um, highest one and the lowest one to get the average of what's happening in between. So, um, Let's see. So we're gonna take, um, since these are the averages, we're gonna take 399 minus the 310 over the 205 minus the 1950. Um, and that, and I type this whole thing in the calculator. So notice that these two data have to go together. So 399 came from 2015. 310 came from 1950. I need to find the difference and then that rate. So we found out that it was this decimal, but since it said to estimate, we round it to the nearest tenth. Um, so that means that this six did make this three go up and then everything else disappeared because it's after the decimal. So I ended up with 1.4 uh, parts per million per year. Okay, that's the yearly increase. Then for part B, it says, write the mathematical model that estimates the average atmospheric concentrate of carbon dioxide C in parts per million X years after 1950. So all I wouldn't have is this, right? Um, if I know that it's increasing that much per year, then each year that goes by after 1950, I just need to multiply it by 1.4 and that'll give me how much it's increasing by, right? The thing is, is that you do also have to include where you begin, right? Remember M, X plus B? So M is the, the rate in which it's changing, but you also have to know where you're beginning at. And in 1950, which is the beginning, right? That's when X is equal to zero. That's the beginning. The actual measurement was 310. So I the cost was 300 or the, the concentration of um, carbon dioxide was 310. So I do need to add that because that's where I'm beginning all of this data, okay? Um, 
Now, when I use that information, when I go to predict for part C, so this is the answer for part B. This is the answer for part A. And then when I go on to do the answer for part B, 2040 means that the X value should be 2040 minus 1950, which means 90 years has passed since 1950. So my X value is 90. I do 1.4 times 90 plus 310, and I do get this 436. And so this is the prediction for 2040. In this problem, it says, if a student saves $64 per week, how long will it take to save enough money to buy a computer? What necessary piece of information is missing that prevents solving the problem? Well, I'm, if I'm a student and I'm saving $64 per week, how do I know when to stop saving? You would have to know what your goal is, right? You need to know how much money you're trying to save to know when you can stop saving. Once you reach that dollar amount that you're trying to save, you're done, okay? You've reached your goal. Problem is, is that the whole point of buying, saving the money is to buy the computer. So if I need to know how much money to save, I need to know how much the computer is that I want. So it says down there, we need to know how much to save. Therefore, we need to know the price of the computer we need to purchase. So what am I missing? I'm missing the price of the computer. And that happens to be the first uh, option, computer price. Oops, I did a drop my pencil. Okay. Number eight says, if two speakers are to be selected from a group of five speakers for a workshop, in how many ways can two speakers be selected? So I've done this kind of, I call it like the tally method, but I've done it, a roster method. It, roster method, not to be confused with set roster method. But anyway, um, so what I do is I just take the first one and I pair him up with everyone. And then I take the second one and I pair him up with everybody to the right. Then the third, everybody to the right. The fourth, everybody to the right. And then by then, the last one would have been paired with everyone. So I do A and B together, A and C, A and D, A and E. And I just, they didn't give me people's names. So I just put A, B, and C, A, B, C, B, and E as the five speakers that they're choosing from, okay? Um, then what I did was once I finished with all the A's all the way to E, I went, I didn't need to do A, B with A because it's already here. It doesn't matter who's first and who's second. It just matters that the two were selected, okay? So I didn't need to go backwards. I just needed to put B with C because that hasn't happened yet. B with D, B with E. Then again, same thing. I don't need to go backwards. That's already there. And this one's already there. So C with D, C with E. Um, and then finally, I move on to the letter D. Again, D, A is already there. D, B is already here. D, C is already there. So all they need is D, E. And then E has already been with all groups, A, B, C, and D. So E doesn't need to be written again. And I counted how many there were as I was working. So we got 10 different ways. Number nine says, express the set using the roster method, the set of odd natural numbers less than five. And it says, choose the, so the correct answer. So I know that all the odd, natural numbers um odd not well odd natural numbers are one two three four five six seven eight all the way toward infinity right odd natural numbers would be the odd numbers one three five seven nine so on and so forth but the odd numbers that are less than five that would just be those guys okay so it'd just be one and three so the set is actually this one here one comma three. Okay, now number 10 says express the set using the roster method. So it says here, uh, and then choose the answer below. So what it does say that X is a natural number. So I wrote down some of the natural numbers. Then um, but it says it's also between X six and eight, okay? 
And not only does it say it's between six and eight, it also says that it includes six and it includes eight. So that means that in this case, if I'm looking at all of these natural numbers, but from six to eight, but including six and including eight, it's these guys here, which are six, seven, and eight. Um, number 11, determine if the set is the empty set. So we have the set X such that X is a US state whose name begins with the letter X. Um, since there are no US states that begin with the letter X, this means that the set is empty. And so I would select this answer here. Same thing for number 12, determine if the set is empty. So we have X is less than or two and X is greater than nine. Um, and it's is the empty set or is not the empty set. So X less than two on the number line is everything to the left of two and do not include two. X is greater than nine is everything to the right of nine and do not include the nine. If you have this word and in between, it's where the two line graphs overlap. So what do the two graphs have in common? Okay, since they do not have anything in common and they do not overlap, um, the set is empty set. Okay, they wouldn't have anything in common, therefore there'd be nothing in the set. And so the answer is it is the empty set. Now for problems one through 15, it says find the cardinal number for the given set. Remember what the cardinal number is. It's the number of elements, distinct elements in your set. So that means the numbers cannot repeat. If they do, you can condense the set to the same numbers without the repeating stuff, okay? It doesn't matter how many times the number five pops up. The number five only counts once as an element. Okay, <clears throat> so here's our set A. 8, 10, 12, 14, 22. So the cardinal number, which can be written like this, the number for the set A um, is five because I have five different or distinct elements. Number 14 is a set like this. X is a content whose name begin continent whose name begins with the letter X. Um, there are no continents whose names begin with the letter X. Therefore, the set is the empty set. That is the cardinal number of the set is zero. And I should say the cardinal number of the empty set is zero. There's nothing in the empty set. So how many distinct elements are there in an empty set? There is none. There are no zero, there are zero. There's no elements in an empty set. Now, number 15 has this, it's just one word in this set. So it only has one element. Now number 16 says answer the following questions about the given sets. So it says A, are the sets equivalent? Explain. B, are the sets equal? Explain. And so here are my sets A and B. Now for A, it can be rewritten. Um, it can be simplified into just two, three, four, and five. If I get rid of all the repeating um, values. And B, if I put that one in order, is also two, three, four, five. Now, um, the cardinal number for A is four because there are four distinct um, elements. And the same for cardinal for number B or set B. It also has four distinct elements. So the sets are equivalent because their cardinal numbers are the same. That's all you have to have in order to be considered equivalent is that the cardinal numbers need to be the same. Now, sets are considered quote unquote equal when they are the exact same set. Okay, so all of the elements are exactly the same. And if you look at the simplified versions of both of those sets, they are exactly the same set. Okay, and their elements are, are exactly the same. Like there's nothing different from those. I think I had a dyslexic moment there. There we go. Now here it says, determine whether subset of, proper subset of, 
both or neither can be placed in the blank to make the statement true. So it says X is a set of all natural numbers where X is gonna be between four and eight, okay? Um, but it doesn't include four and it doesn't include eight. And then here it says the set of natural numbers between four and eight. Literally are saying the exact same thing. This is saying it in words and this is saying it in sim symbols. Um, so I wrote that they are the exact same sets. Therefore, um, it's going to be a subset only. Um, and the reason why is because um, sets can be subsets of themselves. However, proper subsets are subsets which are not equal. So basically a set cannot be a proper subset of itself, okay? So I know that these are exactly the same, which means they cannot be proper subsets of each other. Um, thus, equal sets cannot be proper subsets. So that's that. It's just subsets only, not proper subsets. For number 18, we have the set of X that are natural numbers, um, and X is between five and eight. And over here, we have the set of natural numbers where X is between two and eight, but um, the two and the eight are included. So what I did was I wrote them in roster form first. So if I'm counting numbers between five and eight, that would just be six and seven because five and eight are not included. Here, two and eight are included in all the counting numbers in between. So two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. Um, in this case, all the elements in six, seven are contained in the set two through eight. Therefore, this guy is a subset of the bigger one, okay? So we do get to use this symbol with the bar. Since this subset is not the same, it's not equal to the other one, right? The other one's got more stuff in it. Then this guy can be a proper subset of the big one. So you can actually use both of those symbols in this case, okay? <clears throat> Excuse me. Now for number 19, it says for the given set, first calculate the number of subsets for the set, then calculate the number of proper subsets for the set. And I don't have it written on here, but um, I would write number of subsets to be two to the power n. And then if I want number of proper subsets, I have to remove the original um, subset, the original set itself, because a, an original set can be, or an equivalent set can be a subset, it just can't be a proper subset. So that minus one is basically removing the, um, the set itself from the set of subsets. So we have this set here, 13, 1, 15, 10. And it says the number of subsets is two to the power n, where n is equal to the cardinal number. So then in this case, my cardinal number here is going to be, um, is going to be four, because I have four distinct elements. So then I'm going to be doing two to the fourth power. Now that I'm doing two to the fourth power, I do get this um, 16 here. And so that's going to be the answer for the number of subsets. And then since a set cannot be a proper subset of itself, um, you have the number of proper subsets should be all of the subsets minus one. So two to the fourth power again, minus one, which means that's 16 minus one, which is 15. I'm gonna just minus one from that and get the same 15. Now, number 20 says, find the set A union, the empty set. So I wrote them down or maybe they wrote them. I think they wrote this and I wrote this. So they gave me that A is two, four, five, six, nine. And that little symbol means the empty set. Well, empty set means there's nothing in the roster, okay? So the union, that symbol right there, means the elements, um, U means the elements of the two sets um, have, oh, means the elements the two sets have all together. So we wanna basically put everything all together. So all of these guys' uh, elements and all of the other guys' elements. 
Now, even though the second one doesn't have any to add to the group, we still get a response, okay? It happens to be equivalent to the original A, but that's really not important. We didn't need to know that. This is what they want you to type in. Um, 21 says, find the set A intersect theta. So they gave us U for no reason, and then they gave us this. So the intersection means the elements that the two sets have in common. So if you're doing A intersect the empty set, that means A, which is two, four, six, eight, intersected with an empty set, which means in roster form a set with nothing inside. And what do the two things have in common? Well, if this doesn't have anything in it, then they can't have anything in common. So they have nothing in common and that's the empty set. So in this problem, you just answer the empty set. Now for number 22, it says find the set A union U and they give you U and they give you um, A. Now union means all the elements all together. So it's basically all of these guys and then these as well, if there were any extras. But you notice five, six, seven, and eight are already contained. So this is what you're gonna type in. Now it says for number 23, use the sets for number 22. So the same U and A and find A intersect with U. Now the intersection means what they have in common. So what do these two sets have in common? They have the five, the six, the seven, and the eight in common. And so that is the intersection. And so you would type in these guys. Now for number 24, they have U, the letters between I and K, A, C, D, F, G, I, J. B is C E G I J and C is A C D F H. So it says determine A intersect C. So the intersection means what they have in common. So what do these two sets have in common? Um, they have a C in common, they have a D in common, and they have an F in common. And so then the intersection would be just those three elements. Now here we have U, A, B, and C again, and this one says find the union, A, union, B. So we're looking at these two. Union means all together. So we're gonna have in numerical order, we're gonna have two first, then four, then five, just listed once, six, seven, and nine. And so that is the set for the union, and you would type that in. Now, 26 has U is S, comma T, comma U, V, W, X, and Y. A is just T and U. Use the roster method to write the set A complement, okay? So this is A complement. A complement is basically the universal set, the set of the whole group, minus the one subset that you're talking about, okay? So, the way they show us how to do it is to write all of the elements of U and then just strike out the elements of A. And so notice that A had T and U, so I struck out T and U, and all that's left is S, V, W, X, and Y. And this is the complement of A. For number 27, we have U, all the numbers from 1 to 16, C, all the numbers, all the odd numbers from 1 through 15. And it says, use the roster method to write the set C complement. So just like before, we're going to take the universal set and we're going to strike out all of the items, all of the elements in set C. So here I actually wrote out all the numbers 1 through 16. And then I struck out all of the odd numbers from 1 all the way to 15. And then I wrote what was left over. And so this is the complement of C. 28 is the universal A, B, and C, and it says find the set A union B intersect C. Now remember the operations. You always do complements first, okay? Then what is in the parentheses, and then um, everything else from left to right. Unless you have a complement that's on the outside of the, the parentheses, you have to do what's in the parentheses first before you can do the complement on the outside. That's the only, um, I guess, exception to those main rules. So with this, there's no complements, but there is a parenthesis. So I am gonna have to deal with that parenthesis first. 
So when I'm doing this problem, I'm going to do the B intersect C. So I'm looking at these two sets and I'm finding the intersection, which means the elements in common. So they have two in common and that seems to be it. They don't have anything else in common. So I just have two. Then it says to find A union with this. So I wrote down A, which was one, two, three, six, union what I got for this intersection, which was two. So what do these two things, union means all together, right? This one means all together. So that means I'm gonna be using one, two, once, three, and six. And so this is the actual final solution. Here I have U, A, B, C. They want me to find all of this. Now, none of these complements are outside the parentheses. So I do need to figure out what all of those complements are first. The only ones that are being asked to complement are A and C. So the complement of A is U and then striking out all of the elements of A. So if I have all the numbers from one through nine and I'm striking out these four, that leaves me with two, three, four, five, and nine. Now for C complement, that means I'm gonna look at the universal set one through nine and I'm gonna take out the elements of C so one through five are gone. That's gonna leave me with six, seven, eight, and nine. Then I'm gonna take the complement and intersect it with B. So what does this set, the complement and B have in common? They have four, five in common, and that's it. So that's the set there. Then A complement intersects C complement. So what do these two sets have in common? They only have nine in common. And so that's all I've got there. And then I finally get to put it together. So what I got here for a uh, complement intersect B and A complement intersect C complement, this is a union. So I'm gonna put these two sets together, which gives me the final set four, five, and nine. Now, number 30 says, um, U equals one through eight, A is one, three, four, eight, B is one, two, six, and C is two, three, four, five, seven. So here it asked me to do this. Now here the complement is outside the parentheses. So I do have to do what's inside first. And when you're doing what's inside, you usually go fr uh, from left to right. So normally I would figure out this first and then this, but it's the union of everything. So it just basically means put A, B, and C all together. Okay, so I didn't need to really break that one up. It's all of three of them together. So I look if all three of these, they have a one, a two, a three, a four, a five, a six, a seven, and an eight. So they essentially have all the letters. Um, and then if I'm finding the complement, that means I'm gonna take the universal set and strike out all of these numbers. Well, if I strike out all those numbers, I'm not gonna have no numbers left. So the answer is the empty set. Now, 31 says, use the Venn diagram to list the set A intersect C in roster form. So these are the, the elements, okay? So this set has all of these elements in it. This set has all of these elements in it. And this set has all of these elements in it, okay? And there's 20 elements in this outside area as well. Or not 20 elements, but the number 20 is an element on the outside of all of this, okay? So um, it's asking me for A intersect C, so that's what A and C have in common. Well, that would be where A and C kind of overlap. So it's all of this gray section in here. So what elements are those? 10, 11, and 12. So I listed those elements in roster form there. Number 32 says, use the symbol A, B, union, intersection, and complement as necessary to describe the shaded region. And says, choose the correct answer below. So they've got U, they've got A, and they've got B. So I went and I looked at these. A intersect B would be just this little sliver in the middle. And that's not all that was shaded, so it's not that one. Then I have A union B complement. That would be everything. Um, a union B is both of the circles together. And if you're talking about complement, that would mean outside the circles. So that would explain all of the outside of you being shaded, but it doesn't explain why these pieces are shaded. 
Now A intersect B complement. So this little sliver is A intersect B. The complement would mean everything around that would be shaded. But then that means that A would be shaded too and this little sliver would not be, okay? So it is not that one at all. I mean, by deduction, you can conclude that it's this one, but let's look at it. So A complement means everything outside of A, okay? So that means everything outside of A. And then it says union with B. So that means all of this, it's like a moon, right? So like all of this three quarters moon and the outside is shaded by stating A complement. That little sliver in the middle would not be shaded with A complement, okay? Um, but when they unite it with B, now you're talking about everything, the moon and the outside combined with all of B. So if I'm putting them together, then that now causes me to shade that little sliver because that little sliver is part of B. Um, and so then it does have to be that last option. Now, number 33 says the same directions. Use the symbols A, B, C, union, intersection, and complement as necessary to describe the shaded region. So when we looked at this first one, A intersect B is this little sliver right here, okay? Then to take that and union it with C, well, C is this entire circle. And yeah, this section would end up getting counted twice, right? Once for the C circle and then once for this sliver. But when you're doing a union, you're putting them all together. And so you end up with the sliver and the C all shaded. And that is exactly what we have. If you want to look at the other ones, we can. A union B would be these two. And I didn't even label them, but they're usually always labeled like this by default. Um, so A union B would be the... Um, all of this circle and all of this circle shaded. And since they're not, this is already, well, you gotta finish, I guess. Um, and then intersect with the C complement. So C complement is everything outside of C, which would be this three quarters moon, this three quarters moon, and then all of the U on the outside. Um, and if I intersect that with A union B, which is this little sliver, what do the two things have in common? All they would have in common is this top part of the sliver, okay? So this is definitely not going to be it. Um, if I do just C intersects with A union B, um, then that would mean that only that little tiny corner would be selected. So it cannot be these two. And then A union B again is those two circles. The complement would be this three quarters moon and all of you, okay? And then if I intersect that with C, it would just be all of this little moon, but not these three little slivers there. So it is option A. Now number 34 says a survey of 88 college students was taken to determine the musical styles they liked. Of those, 33 students listen to rock, 34 to classical, and 23 to jazz. Also, 10 students listen to rock and jazz, 20 to rock and classical, and 11 to classical and jazz. Finally, eight students listen to all three musical styles. Construct the Venn diagram and determine the cardinality for each region. Use the completed Venn diagram to answer the following questions. Um, now, I start with the ones that are the that are liked with most styles. So those are the people that like all three. Now, the people that like all three are these eight people right here. Eight people listen to all three. So when I drew the Venn diagram, R for rock, C for classical, and J for jazz, I knew that the eight would go here where all three overlap. Then I go with the two styles. So I know that rock and classical together um rock and classical was 20 um but i need to take out so rock and classical means um this little sliver right here but since i already know that eight of those people are in this section that means only 12 people can be in this section for the whole sliver to have 20 okay now for rock and jazz so now we're talking about this group for rock and jazz it said 10 students listen to rock and jazz but I already know that eight are in here, so that means only two people can be in the other part of that sliver. Then I did uh, jazz and classical. 
So there's 11 people that listen to classical and jazz, which means there's 11 people in this whole sliver. Since I already know this one is eight, that means that only three can be in the remaining part of that sliver. Um, then now I go to those of just like one style. So there were um, 33 that listened to just rock. Now, so that means this whole circle should have 33, but I already have what 22 spoken for, which means only 11 can go here. Then um, when I do only classical, classical was 34. So that means in here, it's gonna be 34. Well, I already have 23 spoken for, which means only 11 can go in here. And then finally for jazz, for jazz, it said that there were 23 people that listened to just jazz or just listen to jazz period. So since it's 23 and I got this whole group, I already have 13 that are spoken for, so I can only have 10 in this remaining spot. Now there were 88 people. So I'm going to take 88 minus all of these numbers in here. And that gives me the 31 people left over that apparently don't like rock, jazz, or classical music. They could like pop music or something else other than these three uh, styles. Um, and so what was the, qu oh, the questions have not been asked. So this was just me trying to figure out how to create this Venn diagram. Now I will go back to that Venn diagram with these questions. So A, how many listen to only rock music? So only rock music would be just these people in this section all by themselves because the people here also listen to classical and the people there also listen to jazz. So only rock would be 11. And that's what we have there. How many listen to classical and jazz, but not rock? So classical and jazz is this little sliver here but it said not rock. So it can't be inside that little circle, which means it's just these guys here, which is three, okay? I guess I could have fit that three there. I just didn't. Um, then the next question says, how many listen to classical or jazz, but not rock? So, or classical or jazz, but not rock. So classical or jazz would be either of these two circles but not rock means nothing inside of here. So it just basically means these three regions. So if I add up those three regions together, that's where we get 24. Now, uh, D says, how many listen to music in exactly one of the musical styles? Um, exactly one would be these guys, these guys, and these guys. So when you add those three regions together, you do get 32. And then E, how many listen to music in exactly two of the musical styles? So if they're listening to two of the music styles, this one is all three. So two would be these three regions. So 12 plus two plus three was 17. And then how many did not listen to any of the music styles? Those are the people that are outside all of these circles, and that was 31. Oops. And so that's the response there. So for number 35 and 36, we have the same directions. We're almost done. We have about four more problems. So write a conclusion to make the following argument valid if it is not possible. State so. If there is water, if there is a water main break, the roads will be slippery. If the roads are slippery, there will be more accidents. If there are more accidents, the police will be busy. The police were busy. It is not possible to make a valid conclusion here since nothing was stated about all the police that are busy. Therefore, we do not know why the police were busy. And so it doesn't necessarily mean that there was a water break or that it was because of slippery roads or because of accident. Um, 36 says, if it snows, the roads will be slick. If the roads are slick, then there will be more accidents. If there are more accidents, police will be busy. It snowed. Well, you can start with these directional in statements. If it snowed, then the roads will be slick. If the roads are slick, then there's more accidents. If there's more accidents, then there's busy. So everything's happening because it snowed. So in the options, you will actually select all of the above. The roads are slick, there's more accidents, and the police are busy because of all these conjectures 
starting with it snowing. Now, number 37 says, um, I could put the directions here. I was trying to fit both problems on one page, but they just didn't seem to work. So three more problems. Um, use Euler diagrams to determine whether each argument is valid or invalid. No rats are dogs, all nice animals are dogs, therefore no rats are nice animals. So these are the options that we have. It says no rats or dogs means that the rat and dog sets should not touch each other or overlap because none of the rats should be dogs, okay? So um, that's gonna outrule option four since, um, or that's gonna rule, yeah, outrule this one because the rats and the dog sets are touching. See here, the rat and dogs are not, here the rat and dogs are not touching, here the rat and dogs are not touching, and here the rat and dogs are not touching. Now, the other statement that says all nice animals are dogs means that the nice set is inside the dog set. And so this outrules option one because the nice is not inside the dogs. Um, here the nice is inside the dogs, here the nice is not inside the dogs, and here the nice is not inside the dogs. So that only leaves you with one option left, which is option two. And this diagram demonstrates that the argument is valid. Um, notice that no rats are nice animals. Now here we have use Euler diagrams to determine whether the following argument is valid or invalid. All fish are cold-blooded creatures. Some cold-blooded creatures are reptiles. Therefore, some are reptiles. So here are your four options. M is fish, C is cold-blooded creatures, and P is reptiles. Now here's the reasoning. All fish are cold-blooded creatures means that the set M for fish should be inside the set N. This outrules options two and four. Notice that how M is not inside N here, M is not inside N here, okay? Then it says some old cold-blooded creatures are reptiles. This means that the set N and P should touch or overlap. This outrules none of the options because P and N do overlap in both of these, okay? It's just here, it doesn't include any of the fish and here it does include some of the fish. Um, it was not stated that some fish are reptiles, so it cannot be option one. Therefore, it is option three. The diagram um, in option three demonstrates that the fish are not reptiles are since they don't overlap, the argument is invalid, okay? So if we're gonna say that it's this one, guess what? The fish and the reptile section do not touch each other. So the fish cannot be reptiles. So for you to say that some fish are reptiles, it's an invalid statement. Now 39 says, consider the following two statements. All new Corollas are excellent items. Some new Corollas are lousy. C is the set of new Corollas, E is a set of excellent items, and L is the set of lousy items. Which is correct, either diagram. So here's the logic. All new Corollas are excellent items means that the set C should be inside the set E. This outrules options one, three, and six. C, E, C should be inside of E, which is not happening here. Um, C is inside of E, C is not inside of E, C is inside of E, C is inside of E, and here C is not entirely inside of E as it should be. Because it said all, this is saying that some of the Corollas are not um, excellent items. And then some new Corollas are lousy items. This means that C and L should overlap. So that outrules option four because C and L are not overlapping. And it rules, outrules option five because C and L are not overlapping. So that only leaves me with option two to select as my Euler diagram. And that was the last question. So um, I will see you guys in the next video, which will be on the next unit, starting with chapter seven. You guys have a good one and I'll see you in the next one.